Being a subscriber to the National Geographic, I get to read about the most amazing things in the world and see the most incredible photographs. In the April 2010 edition, it was a special issue on water. And I had a few comments and points I would like to share with you all. So firstly, I would like to talk a bit about the background and the issue regarding water, just in case some of you may not be familiar. When I was growing up as a child, I looked around and I, and I said, water will never run out. We have so much. 70% of the planet is water. Silly me, I didn't realise that most of this was salty water. We can't use it. We need fresh water. And from that point on, water began to intrigue me. Because water is a resource. Just like a coal, a coal, oil, gas, food. You know, it's like any resource, we need it. And also, it's scarce. So, we are in this problem where without water, we'll basically die. And our population is growing exponentially. And on the other hand, water is a scarce resource. Every day we're consuming more of it, not just because um, there's more people in the world. Our lifestyles are changing. Look at Las Vegas. It's a desert. To keep those fake lawns and those fountains, how much water do we use? A lot. So um, that's the problem uh, uh, surrounding water. But in the 21st century, we have uh, solutions and um, uh, technical advancements, which are basically technical technological advancements which are allowing us to increase the amount of fresh water we have in our world. So desalination was a major area of this addition. And what they were saying is that in the past, for three main reasons, desalination has not been seen as a, a viable solution because the costs always outweighed the benefits. And that was, it was expensive, um, the accessibility of desalination plants was not easy, organising that many people, construction, have to build on land, which is also another resource, blah, blah, blah. And the third issue is that the amount of energy needed to actually separate the salt from water was so much, it goes against all of our efforts to mitigate climate change. Was it really worth it? So now we have three new technologies which are hoping to deal with, sorry, which are hoping to deal with um, desalination. The first one being forward osmosis, the second one being carbon nanotubes, and the third one being by mimetics. Um, forward osmosis came out this year, 2010, whereas the others are coming out in 2013. Now, what is interesting about these methods is that they will help us, uh, they will probably make desalination plants much more cheaper because as one knows with time um, the price of technology drops as new ideas come out so you know the expensive cost side of it goes the whole issue surrounding um, you know is such a big project um, all of that kind of the secondary issues well what is a necessity that's bound to go we're probably going to need desalination plants it will have to be built and the third issue the amount of energy needed is probably likely to decrease just like a light bulb now you can get an energy efficient light bulb it requires less energy than a normal light bulb so like that the energy uses will be cut and desalination is going to become an important part of our life so that's a bit about the background to um, water. So why is water and you know these desalination solutions so important economically? Well because there's countries all around the globe whether it be in India or Ethiopia or anywhere where people, women, men, children have to walk days on end to get water which probably is contaminated and then bring it back and drink it. Now just there's a big opportunity cost lost here because if they were able to be uh, you know if these people had access to fresh clean water through desalination because you know the price dropped out of desalination new technology everything was more efficient all the benefits we mentioned before if they were uh, able to access this it would be great because then they could spend their time 
in uh, you know reading education training working and these are all um, if not long term some of them are even short term ways of increasing a productivity in a country and if we increase productivity we have economic growth increased GDP and the reason why increased GDP and economic growth is important is primarily because increases the quality of life. The quality of life index survey in 2008 um, proved this if you look at the comparison between Switzerland and Zimbabwe. But that's another video for another day. So let's get on to what I'm very interested in, the religious aspect of water. So if we look at this, find some photos here. Now water intrigues me in this aspect because it's a mutual element which between all religions has an importance. You know, some may say even other elements like fire does. You know, there's a whole religion, Zoroastrianism, devoted to fire. But the problem with fire is that, for example, in my religion, I'm Sikh, fire is not really of much importance. It is important, it's the creation of mankind and stuff. But how much is it mentioned in my holy book? And look at other religions. Fire, I'm not sure, I don't think in Judaism too. It's a, you know, a really important thing. I know you light the candles and all that. But it's not as important as water. Water, you do, you use before praying. You use to wash your hands. Nearly every religious pilgrimage place has something to do with water. I was I was intrigued because I didn't know that um, in a mosque water is important because it's it's important cleanliness is so important and that water is said to be special. I think it's called the wudu when they wash their hands and everything before going to pray. And they showed here some beautiful images that water they say has healing powers. This is the river Ganges. I think it's very important, but. I question it because I'm Sikh. I went to Amritsar actually in October. And you know, over there, you, it's, some people say you should have a bath in the water because it's holy, it has healing power. Other people say it will wash away your sins. Then others say um, it's just something you should do if you're Sikh. It's part of the culture, it's your tradition. You know, so there's many different ideas about why we do it. And I never quite realized for myself why it was important, but you can go and have like a, you go into the water there and you like kind of dip yourself in the water about like five or seven times saying God's name. That was what I was told to do for my mum. And it's interesting because that, that's not nearly a religion. Like Christianity, when you're baptized three times, you're dipped in water. Hindus, they go to the Ganges, they just have a bath there. And it's, you know, the same kind of thing that's running everywhere. And I'm actually going to Lourdes this summer. And again, the water there is important. So to have healing and magical powers. And, you know, so many people every year make this pil pilgrimage. You know, in our culture especially, people, when they go to, like, the Golden Temple in Amritsar, they bring back little bottles of the water. And they call it gel. And they keep it there. You know, if anybody becomes ill, oh, put a bit in your mouth. Why is water so important in religion compared to another element? And the fact that water is scarce, it's a little bit contradictory because if water is so important, it's mentioned in every holy book, especially in the creation stories, it's given by God, etc., etc. Why don't we have unlimited sources of it? Why do humans, again, need to step in and try and increase the water supply from themselves. Why hasn't God given us this holy, this magical, this sacred water in unlimited amounts? And again, there we come to the economic problem, basic economic. We have limited resources and unlimited ones.